Section 30 of The Fable of the Bees by Bernard Mandeville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To me it is a great pleasure, when I look on the affairs of human life, to behold into what various and often strangely opposite forms the hope of gain and thoughts of lucre shape men, according to the different employments they are of and stations they are in. How gay and merry does every face appear at a well-ordered ball, and what a solemn sadness is observed at the masquerade of a funeral! But the undertaker is as much pleased with his gains as the dancing master. Both are equally tired in their occupations, and the mirth of the one is as much forced as the gravity of the other is affected. Those who have never minded the conversation of a spruce mercer and a young lady his customer that comes into his shop have neglected a scene of life that is very entertaining i beg of my serious reader that he would for a while abate a little of his gravity and suffer me to examine these people separately as to their inside and the different motives they act from his business is to sell as much silk as he can at a price by which he shall get what he proposes to be reasonable according to the customary profits of the trade. As to the lady, what she would be at is to please her fancy, and buy cheaper by a groat or sixpence per yard than the things she wants are commonly sold at. From the impression the gallantry of our sex has made upon her, she imagines, if she be not very deformed, that she has a fine, mean, and easy behavior, and a peculiar sweetness of voice, that she is handsome, and if not beautiful, at least more agreeable than most young women she knows, as she has no pretensions to purchase the same things with less money than other people, but what are built on her good qualities, so she sets herself off to the best advantage her wit and discretion will let her. The thoughts of love are here out of the case, so on the one hand she has no room for playing the tyrant and giving herself angry and peevish airs, and on the other more liberty of speaking kindly and being affable than she can have almost on any other occasion. She knows that abundance of well-bred people come to his shop, and endeavors to render herself as amiable as virtue and the rules of decency allow of. Coming with such a resolution of behavior, she cannot meet with anything to ruffle her temper. Before her coach is yet quite stopped, she is approached by a gentleman-like man that has everything clean and fashionable about him, who in low obeisance pays her homage, and as soon as her pleasure is known that she has a mind to come in, hands her into the shop, where immediately he slips from her, and through a byway that remains visible only for half a moment, with great address entrenches himself behind the counter, here facing her with a profound reverence and modish phrase. He begs the favor of knowing her commands. Let her say and dislike what she pleases, she can never be directly contradicted. She deals with a man in whom consummate patience is one of the mysteries of his trade, and whatever trouble she creates she is sure to hear nothing but the most obliging language, and has always before her a cheerful countenance, where joy and respect seem to be blended with good humor, and altogether make up an artificial serenity more engaging than untaught nature is able to produce. When two persons are so well met, the conversation must be very agreeable, as well as extremely mannerly, though they talk about trifles. While she remains irresolute what to take, he seems to be the same in advising her, and is very cautious how to direct her choice. But when once she has made it and is fixed, he immediately becomes positive that it is the best of the sort, extols her fancy, and the more he looks upon it, the more he wonders he should not before have discovered the preeminence of it over anything he has in the shop. By precept, example, and great application, he has learned unobserved to slide into the inmost recesses of the soul, sound the capacity of his customers, and find out their blind side unknown to them. By all which he is instructed in fifty other stratagems to make her overvalue her own judgment as well as the commodities she would purchase. The greatest advantage he has over her lies in the most material part of the commerce between them, the debate about the price, which he knows to a farthing, and she is wholly ignorant of. 
therefore he nowhere more egregiously imposes on her understanding and though here he has the liberty of telling what lies he pleases as to the prime cost and the money he has refused yet he trusts not to them only but attacking her vanity makes her believe the most incredible things in the world concerning his own weakness and her superior abilities he had taken a resolution he says never to part with that piece under such a price but she has the power of talking him out of his goods beyond anybody he ever sold to he protests that he loses by his silk but seeing that she has a fancy for it and is resolved to give no more rather than disoblige a lady he has such an uncommon value for he will let her have it and only begs that another time she will not stand so hard with him in the meantime the buyer who knows that she is no fool and has a voluble tongue is easily persuaded that she has a very winning way of talking and thinking it sufficient for the sake of good breeding to disown her merit and in some witty repartee retort the compliment he makes her swallow very contentedly the substance of everything he tells her the upshot is that with the satisfaction of having saved ninepence per yard she has bought her silk exactly at the same price as anybody else might have done and often gives sixpence more than rather than not have sold it he would have taken it is possible that this lady for want of being sufficiently flattered for a fault she is pleased to find in his behaviour or perhaps the tying of his neckcloth or some other dislike as substantial may be lost and her custom bestowed on some other of the fraternity but where many of them live in a cluster it is not always easily determined which shop to go to and the reasons some of the fair sex have for their choice are often very whimsical and kept as great a secret we never follow our inclinations with more freedom than where they cannot be traced and it is unreasonable for others to suspect them a virtuous woman has preferred one house to all the rest because she had seen a handsome fellow in it and another of no bad character for having received greater civility before it than had been paid her anywhere else when she had no thoughts of buying and was going to paul's church for among the fashionable mercers the fair dealer must keep before his own door and to draw in random customers make use of no other freedom or importunities than an obsequious air with a submissive posture and perhaps a bow to every well-dressed female that offers to look towards his shop what i have said last makes me think on another way of inviting customers the most distant in the world from what i have been speaking of i mean that which is practised by the watermen especially on those whom by their mien and garb they know to be peasants it is not unpleasant to see half a dozen people surround a man they never saw in their lives before and two of them that can get the nearest clapping each arm over his neck hug him in as loving and familiar a manner as if he was their brother newly come home from an east india voyage a third lays hold of his hand another of his sleeve his coat the buttons of it or anything he can come at while a fifth or sixth who has scampered twice round him already without being able to get at him plants himself directly before the man in hold and within three inches of his nose contradicting his rivals with an open-mouthed cry shows him a dreadful set of large teeth and a small remainder of chewed bread and cheese which the countryman's arrival had hindered from being swallowed at all this no offence is taken and the peasant justly thinks they are making much of him therefore far from opposing them he patiently suffers himself to be pushed or pulled which way the strength that surrounds him shall direct he has not the delicacy to find fault with a man's breath who has just blown out his pipe or a greasy head of hair that is rubbing against his chops dirt and sweat he has been used to from his cradle and it is no disturbance to him to hear half a score people some of them at his ear and the furthest not five foot from him bawl out as if he was hundred yards off he is conscious that he makes no less noise when he is merry himself and is secretly pleased with their boisterous usages the hauling and pulling him about he construes the way it is intended it is a courtship he can feel and understand he cannot help wishing them well for the esteem they seem to have for him he loves to be taken notice of and admires the londoners for being so pressing in the offers of their service to him for the value of threepence or less 
whereas in the country at the shop he uses he can have nothing but he must first tell them what he wants and though he lays out three or four shillings at a time has hardly a word spoke to him unless it be an answer to a question himself is forced to ask first this alacrity in his behalf moves his gratitude and unwilling to disoblige any from his heart he knows not whom to choose i have seen a man think all this or something like it as plainly as i could see the nose in his face and at the same time move along very contentedly under a load of watermen and with a smiling countenance carry seven or eight stone more than his own weight to the waterside if the little mirth i have shown in the drawing of these two images from low life misbecomes me i am sorry for it but i promise not to be guilty of that fault any more and will now without loss of time proceed with my argument in artless dull simplicity and demonstrate the gross error of those who imagine that the social virtues and the amiable qualities that are praiseworthy in us are equally beneficial to the public as they are to the individual persons that are possessed of them and that the means of thriving and whatever conduces to the welfare and real happiness of private families must have the same effect upon the whole society this i confess i have labored for all along and i flatter myself not unsuccessfully but i hope nobody will like a problem the worse for seeing the truth of it proved more ways than one it is certain that the fewer desires a man has and the less he covets the more easy he is to himself the more active he is to supply his own wants and the less he requires to be waited upon the more he will be beloved and the less trouble he is in a family the more he loves peace and concord the more charity he has for his neighbor and the more he shines in real virtue there is no doubt but that in proportion he is acceptable to god and man but let us be just what benefit can these things be of or what earthly good can they do to promote the wealth the glory and worldly greatness of nations it is the sensual courtier that sets no limit to his luxury the fickle strumpet that invents new fashions every week the haughty duchess that in equipage entertainments and all her behavior would imitate a princess the profuse rake and lavish air that scatter about their money without wit or judgment buy everything they see and either destroy or give it away the next day the covetous and perjured villain that squeezed an immense treasure from the tears of widows and orphans and left the prodigals the money to spend it is these that are the prey and proper food of a full-grown leviathan or in other words such is the calamitous condition of human affairs that we stand in need of the plagues and monsters i named to have all the variety of labor performed which the skill of men is capable of inventing in order to procure an honest livelihood to the vast multitudes of working poor that are required to make a large society and it is folly to imagine that great and wealthy nations can subsist and be at once powerful and polite without i protest against popery as much as luther and calvin did or queen elizabeth herself but i believe from my heart that the reformation has scarce been more instrumental in rendering the kingdoms and states that have embraced it flourishing beyond other nations than the silly and capricious invention of hooped and quilted petticoats but if this should be denied me by the enemies of priestly power at least i am sure that bar the great men who have fought for and against that layman's blessing it has from its beginning to this day not employed so many hands honest industrious laboring hands as the abominable improvement on female luxury i named has done in few years religion is one thing and trade is another he that gives most trouble to thousands of his neighbors and invents the most operose manufactures is right or wrong the greatest friend to the society what a bustle is there to be made in several parts of the world before a fine scarlet or crimson cloth can be produced what multiplicity of trades and artificers must be employed not only such as are obvious as woolcombers, spinners the weaver the cloth worker the scourer the dyer the setter the drawer and the packer but others that are more remote and might seem foreign to it as the millwright the pewterer and the chemist 
which yet are all necessary, as well as a great number of other handicrafts, to have the tools, utensils, and other implements belonging to the trades already named. But all these things are done at home, and may be performed without extraordinary fatigue or danger. The most frightful prospect is left behind, when we reflect on the toil and hazard that are to be undergone abroad, the vast seas we are to go over, the different climates we are to endure, and the several nations we must be obliged to for their assistance. Spain alone, it is true, might furnish us with wool to make the finest cloth. But what skill and pains, what experience and ingenuity are required to dye it of those beautiful colors? How widely are the drugs and other ingredients dispersed through the universe that are to meet in one kettle? Alum, indeed, we have of our own. Our goal we might have from the Rhine, and vitriol from Hungary. All this is in Europe, but then for saltpeter in quantity, we are forced to go as far as the East Indies. Cochineal, unknown to the ancients, is not much nearer to us, though in a quite different part of the earth. We buy it, it is true, from the Spaniards, but not being their product, they are forced to fetch it for us from the remotest corner of the new world in the East Indies. While so many sailors are broiling in the sun and sweltered with heat in the east and west of us, another set of them are freezing in the north to fetch potashes from Russia. When we are thoroughly acquainted with all the variety of toil and labor, the hardships and calamities that must be undergone to compass the end I speak of, and we consider the vast risks and perils that are run in those voyages, and that few of them are ever made but at the expense not only of the health and welfare, but even the lives of many. When we are acquainted with, I say, and duly consider the things I named, it is scarce possible to conceive a tyrant so inhuman and void of shame that, beholding things in the same view, he should exact such terrible services from his innocent slaves, and, at the same time, dare to own that he did it for no other reason than the satisfaction a man receives from having a garment made of scarlet or crimson cloth. But to what height of luxury must a nation be arrived, where not only the king's officers, but likewise the guards, even the private soldiers, should have such impudent desires? But if we turn the prospect, and look on all those labors as so many voluntary actions, belonging to different callings and occupations, that men are brought up to for a livelihood, and in which every one works for himself, how much soever he may seem to labor for others. If we consider that even the sailors who undergo the greatest hardships, as soon as one voyage is ended, even after shipwreck, are looking out and soliciting for employment in another, if we consider, I say, and look on these things in another view, we shall find that the labor of the poor is so far from being a burden and an imposition upon them, that to have employment is a blessing, which, in their address to heaven, they pray for, and to procure it for the generality of them is the greatest care of every legislature. As children and even infants are the apes of others, so all youth have an ardent desire of being men and women, and become often ridiculous by their impatient endeavors to appear what everybody sees they are not. All large societies are not a little indebted to this folly for the perpetuity, or at least long continuance, of trades once established. What pains will young people take, and what violence will they not commit upon themselves to attain to insignificant and often blamable qualifications, which, for want of judgment and experience, they admire in others, that are superior to them in age. This fondness of imitation makes them accustom themselves, by degrees, to the use of things that were irksome, if not intolerable to them at first, till they know not how to leave them, and are often very sorry for having inconsiderately increased the necessaries of life without any necessity. What estates have been got by tea and coffee? What a vast traffic is drove, what a variety of labor is performed in the world to the maintenance of thousands of families that altogether depend on two silly, if not odious, customs, the taking of snuff and smoking of tobacco, both which, it is certain, do infinitely more hurt than good to those that are addicted to them. I shall go further and demonstrate the usefulness of private losses and misfortunes to the public, 
and the folly of our wishes when we pretend to be most wise and serious the fire of london was a great calamity but if the carpenters bricklayers smiths and all not only that are employed in building but likewise those that made and dealt in the same manufactures and other merchandises that were burnt and other trades again that got by them when they were in full employ were to vote against those who lost by the fire the rejoicings would equal if not exceed the complaints in recruiting what is lost and destroyed by fire storms sea fights sieges battles a considerable part of trade consists the truth of which and whatever i have said of the nature of society will plainly appear from what follows it would be a difficult task to enumerate all the advantages and different benefits that accrue to a nation on account of shipping and navigation but if we only take into consideration the ships themselves and every vessel great and small that is made use of for water carriage from the least wherry to a first-rate man of war the timber and hands that are employed in the building of them and consider the pitch tar rosin grease the masts yards sails and riggings the variety of smith's work the cables oars and everything else belonging to them we shall find that to furnish only such a nation as ours with all the necessaries make up a considerable part of the traffic of europe without speaking of the stores and ammunition of all sorts that are consumed in them or the mariners watermen and others with their families that are maintained by them but should we on the other hand take a view of the manifold mischiefs and variety of evils moral as well as natural that befall nations on the score of seafaring and their commerce with strangers the prospect would be very frightful and we could suppose a large populous island that should be wholly unacquainted with ships and sea affairs but otherwise a wise and well-governed people and that some angel or their genius should lay before them a scheme or draft where they might see on the one side all the riches and real advantages that would be acquired by navigation in a thousand years and on the other the wealth and lives that would be lost and all the other calamities that would be unavoidably sustained on account of it during the same time i am confident they would look upon ships with horror and detestation and that their prudent rulers would severely forbid the making and inventing all buildings or machines to go to sea with of what shape or denomination soever and prohibit all such abominable contrivances on great penalties if not the pain of death but to let alone the necessary consequence of foreign trade the corruption of manners as well as plagues poxes and other diseases that are brought to us by shipping should we only cast our eyes on what is either to be imputed to the wind and weather the treachery of the seas the ice of the north the vermin of the south the darkness of nights and unwholesomeness of climates or else occasioned by the want of good provisions and the faults of mariners and unskilfulness of some and the neglect and drunkenness of others and should we consider the losses of men and treasure swallowed up in the deep the tears and necessities of widows and orphans made by the sea the ruin of merchants and the consequences the continual anxieties that parents and wives are in for the safety of their children and husbands and not forget the many pangs and heartaches that are felt throughout a trading nation by owners and insurers at every blast of wind should we cast our eyes i say on these things consider with due attention and give them the weight they deserve would it not be amazing how a nation of thinking people should talk of their ships and navigation as a peculiar blessing to them and placing an uncommon felicity in having an infinity of vessels dispersed through the wide world and always some going to and others coming from every part of the universe but let us once in our consideration on these things confine ourselves to what the ships suffer only the vessels themselves with their rigging and appurtenances without thinking on the freight they carry or the hands that work them and we shall find that the damage sustained that way only is very considerable and must one year with another amount to vast sums the ships that are foundered at sea split against rocks and swallowed up by sands some by the fierceness of tempests altogether others by that and the want of pilots experience and knowledge of the coasts the masts that are blown down or forced to be cut and thrown overboard 
the yard sails and cordage of different sizes that are destroyed in storms and the anchors that are lost add to these the necessary repairs of leaks sprung and other hurts received from the rage of winds and the violence of the waves many ships are set on fire by carelessness and the effects of strong liquors which none are more addicted to than sailors sometimes unhealthy climates at others the badness of provision breed fatal distempers that sweep away the greatest part of the crew and not a few ships are lost for want of hands these are all calamities inseparable from navigation and seem to be great impediments that clog the wheels of foreign commerce how happy would a merchant think himself if his ships should always have fine weather and the wind he wished for and every mariner he employed from the highest to the lowest be a knowing experienced sailor and a careful sober good man was such a felicity to be had for prayers what owner of ships is there or dealer in europe nay the whole world who would not be all day long teasing heaven to obtain such a blessing for himself without regard to what detriment it would do to others such a petition would certainly be a very unconscionable one yet where is the man who imagines not that he has a right to make it and therefore as every one pretends to an equal claim to those favours let us without reflecting on the impossibility of its being true suppose all their prayers effectual and their wishes answered and afterwards examine into the result of such a happiness ships would last as long as timber houses to the full because they are as strongly built and the latter are liable to suffer by high winds and other storms which the first by our supposition are not to be so that before there would be any real occasion for new ships the master builders now in being and everybody under them that is set to work about them would all die a natural death if they were not starved or come to some untimely end for in the first place all ships having prosperous gales and never waiting for the wind they would make very quick voyages both out and home secondly no merchandises would be damaged by the sea or by stress of weather thrown overboard but the entire landing would always come safe ashore and hence it would follow that three parts in four of the merchantmen already made would be superfluous for the present and the stock of ships that are now in the world serve a vast many years masts and yards would last as long as the vessels themselves and we should not need to trouble norway on that score a great while yet the sails and rigging indeed of the few ships made use of would wear out but not a quarter part so fast as now they do for they often suffer more in one hour's storm than in ten days fair weather anchors and cables there would be seldom any occasion for and one of each would last a ship time out of mind this article alone would yield many a tedious holiday to the anchor smiths and the rope yards this general want of consumption would have such an influence on the timber merchants and all that import iron sailcloth hemp pitch tar etc that four parts in five of what in the beginning of this reflection on sea affairs i said made a considerable branch of the traffic of europe would be entirely lost i have only touched hitherto on the consequences of this blessing in relation to shipping but it would be detrimental to all other branches of trade besides and destructive to the poor of every country that exports anything of their own growth or manufacture the goods and merchandises that every year go to the deep that are spoiled at sea by salt water by heat by vermin destroyed by fire or lost to the merchant by other accidents all owing to storms or tedious voyages or else the neglect or rapacity of sailors such goods i say and merchandise are a considerable part of what every year is sent abroad throughout the world and must have employed great multitudes of poor before they could come on board a hundred bales of cloth that are burnt or sunk in the mediterranean are as beneficial to the poor in england as if they had safely arrived at smyrna or aleppo and every yard of them had been retailed on the grand seigneur's dominions the merchant may break and by him the clothier the dyer the packer and other tradesmen the middling people may suffer but the poor that were set to work about them can never lose day labourers commonly receive their earnings once a week and all the working people that were employed either in any of the various branches of manufacture itself or the several land and water carriages it requires to be brought to perfection from the sheep's back to the vessel it was entered in were paid 
at least much the greatest part of them before the parcel came on board should any of my readers draw conclusions in infinitum from my assertions that goods sunk or burnt are as beneficial to the poor as if they had been well sold and put to their proper uses i would count him a caviller and not worth answering should it always rain and the sun never shine the fruits of the earth would soon be rotten and destroyed and yet it is no paradox to affirm that to have grass or corn rain is as necessary as the sunshine in what manner this blessing of fair winds and fine weather would affect the mariners themselves and the breed of sailors may be easily conjectured from what has been said already as there would hardly one ship in four be made use of so the vessels themselves being always exempt from storms fewer hands would be required to work them and consequently five and six of the seamen we have might be spared which in this nation most employments of the poor being overstocked would be but an untoward article as soon as those superfluous seamen should be extinct it would be impossible to man such large fleets as we could at present but i do not look upon this as a detriment or the least inconveniency for the reduction of mariners as to numbers being general throughout the world all the consequence would be that in case of war the maritime powers would be obliged to fight with fewer ships which would be an happiness instead of an evil and would you carry this felicity to the highest pitch of perfection it is but to add one desirable blessing more and no nation shall ever fight at all the blessing i hint at is what all good christians are bound to pray for viz that all princes and states would be true to their oaths and promises and just to one another as well as their own subjects that they might have a greater regard for the dictates of conscience and religion than those of state politics and worldly wisdom and prefer the spiritual welfare of others to their own carnal desires and the honesty the safety the peace and tranquillity of the nations they govern to their own love of glory spirit of revenge avarice and ambition the last paragraph will to many seem a digression that makes little for my purpose but what i mean by it is to demonstrate that goodness integrity and a peaceful disposition in rulers and governors of nations are not the proper qualifications to aggrandize them and increase their numbers any more than the uninterrupted series of success that every private person would be blessed with if he could and which i have shown would be injurious and destructive to a large society that should place a felicity in worldly greatness and being envied by their neighbors and value themselves upon their honor and their strength no man needs to guard himself against blessings but calamities require hands to avert them the amiable qualities of man put none of the species upon stirring his honesty his love of company his goodness content and frugality are so many comforts to an indolent society and the more real and unaffected they are the more they keep everything at rest and peace and the more they will everywhere prevent trouble and motion itself the same almost may be said of the gifts and munificence of heaven and all the bounties and benefits of this nature this is certain that the more extensive they are and the greater plenty we have of them the more we save our labor but the necessities the vices and imperfections of man together with the various inclemencies of the air and other elements contain in them the seeds of all arts industry and labors it is the extremities of heat and cold the inconstancy and badness of seasons the violence and uncertainty of winds the vast power and treachery of war the rage and untractableness of fire and the stubbornness and sterility of the earth that rack our invention how we shall either avoid the mischiefs they may produce or correct the malignity of them and turn their several forces to our own advantage a thousand different ways while we are employed in supplying the infinite variety of our wants which will ever be multiplied as our knowledge is enlarged and our desires increase hunger thirst and nakedness are the first tyrants that force us to stir afterwards our pride sloth sensuality and fickleness are the great patrons that promote all arts and sciences trades handicrafts and callings while the great taskmasters necessity avarice envy and ambition each in the class that belongs to him keep the members of the society to their labor and make them all submit most of them cheerfully to the drudgery of their station kings and princes not excepted 
The greater the variety of trades and manufactures, the more operose they are, and the more they are divided in many branches, the greater numbers may be contained in a society without being in one another's way, and the more easily they may be rendered a rich, potent, and flourishing people. Few virtues employ any hands, and therefore they may render a small nation good, but they can never make a great one. To be strong and laborious, patient in difficulties, and assiduous in all business, are commendable qualities, but as they do their own work, so they are their own reward, and neither art nor industry have ever paid their compliments to them, whereas the excellency of human thought and contrivance has been, and is yet nowhere more conspicuous than in the variety of tools and instruments of workmen and artificers, and the multiplicity of engines that were all invented either to assist the weakness of man, to correct his many imperfections, to gratify his laziness, or obviate his impatience. It is in morality as it is in nature. There is nothing so perfectly good in creatures that it cannot be hurtful to any one of the society, nor anything so entirely evil, but it may prove beneficial to some part or other of the creation. So that things are only good and evil in reference to something else, and according to the light and position they are placed in. What pleases us is good in that regard, and by this rule every man wishes well for himself to the best of his capacity, with little respect to his neighbor. There never was any rain yet, though in a very dry season, when public prayers had been made for it, but somebody or other, who wanted to go abroad, wished it might be fair weather only for that day. When the corn stands thick in the spring, and the generality of the country rejoice at the pleasing object, the rich farmer who kept his last year's crop for a better market, pines at the sight, and inwardly grieves at the prospect of a plentiful harvest. Nay, we shall often hear your idle people openly wish for the possessions of others, and not to be injurious, forsooth, add this wise proviso, that it should be without detriment to the owners. But I am afraid they often do it without any such restriction in their hearts. It is a happiness that the prayers as well as wishes of most people are insignificant and good for nothing, or else the only thing that could keep mankind fit for society and the world from falling into confusion would be the impossibility that all the petitions made to heaven should be granted. A dutiful pretty young gentleman newly come from his travels lies at Briel waiting with impatience for an easterly wind to waft him over to England, where a dying father who wants to embrace and give him his blessing before he yields his breath lies honing after him, melted with grief and tenderness. In the meanwhile, a British minister, who is to take care of the Protestant interest in Germany, is riding post to Harwich, and in violent haste to be at Ratisbonne before the diet breaks up. At the same time, a rich fleet lies ready for the Mediterranean, and a fine squadron is bound for the Baltic. All these things may probably happen at once, at least there is no difficulty in supposing they should. If these people are not atheists, or very great reprobates, they will all have some good thoughts before they go to sleep, and consequently about bedtime they must all differently pray for a fair wind and a prosperous voyage. I do not say but it is their duty, and it is possible they may be all heard, but I am sure they cannot be all served at the same time. After this, I flatter myself to have demonstrated that, neither the friendly qualities and kind affections that are natural to man, nor the real virtues he is capable of acquiring by reason and self-denial, are the foundation of society, but that what we call evil in this world, moral as well as natural, is the grand principle that makes us sociable creatures, the solid basis, the life and support of all trades and employments without exception that there we must look for the true origin of all arts and sciences, and that the moment evil ceases, the society must be spoiled, if not totally dissolved. I could add a thousand things to enforce, and further illustrate this truth, with abundance of pleasure, but for fear of being troublesome, I shall make an end, though I confess that I have not been half so solicitous to gain the approbation of others, as I have studied to please myself in this amusement. Yet, if I ever hear that by following this diversion I have given any to the intelligent reader, it will always add to the satisfaction I have received in the performance. In the hope my vanity forms of this, 
I leave him with regret, and conclude with repeating the seeming paradox, the substance of which is advanced in the title page, that private vices, by the dexterous management of a skilful politician, may be turned into public benefits. End of section 30